Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Welcome to the world premiere of the new film by Michael Winterbottom, Greed. Yes. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director and co-head here at TIFF, and I'm glad to see you all here. You're the very first audience in the world to see this film. So thank you so much for coming. To begin, we want to acknowledge where we are today. This is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat. They've been on this land and taking care of this land for thousands of years. Uh, by the, you may not know that there's been human activity on this land for 15,000 years, and we are grateful to be fairly new arrivals and to be sharing this land with uh, everyone else here and with you tonight. Uh, please go ahead. A reminder that this film is eligible for our most important prize. That's the Grolsch People's Choice Award. That's the award that you vote for. Please remember to vote. You do that by going online to tiff.net slash vote. Big thanks to uh, Sony Pictures International Productions and Sony Pictures Classics for providing us with this film. Thanks also to the British Film Council for their generous support. And thanks most of all to Michael Winterbottom, who returns to Toronto after having brought so many films here for you over the years. A remarkable filmmaker whose work you may well know. Uh, a man who was born in Blackburn, Lancashire, which was, I think, made famous in that Beatles song. Uh, he's uh, made a number of films that have come here, including Jude back in 1996, Wonderland in 1999, In This World in 2002, Tristram Shandy, A Cock and Bull Story, A Summer in Genoa, The Trip in 2010, one of my very favorites, The Wedding Guest, and Greed is his most recent film. His films span the gamut uh, from comedy to very serious drama uh, uh, to genre films in some, sense, in some cases as well. What I find unites nearly all of his work is there's a very strong sense of justice and a very strong sense of the absurd. And Greed is the film where both of those <laughs> sensibilities come together. When you see it, you'll know exactly what I mean. He's put together a remarkable cast uh, led by Steve Coogan and also Isla Fisher is in the film. Brilliant actors. And he's come to introduce the film to you this evening. Please join me in welcoming Michael Winterbottom. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that introduction. I just want to say, first of all, thank you to Sony and Film 4 for financing the film uh, and for Sony Picture Classics for choosing to release it in uh, North America. But I want to say a real special thank you to Cameron and to Toronto for selecting it to come here. Uh, it's a real honor and a, a pleasure to be here to show the film as a world premiere here. As, 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 as Cameron said, I think the first time I came here was more than 25 years ago, so I've been coming here a lot of times. Uh, and uh, I think, you know, over the years it's got more and more important as an independent filmmaker to have the support of festivals uh, like Toronto and of people like Cameron. So a really genuine thank you for, for inviting the film. Uh, I'd like to introduce one or two people who uh, help work on the film. First of all, the producer, Melissa Parmenter. Uh, and, and the actors, uh, Christophe de Choisy and Manolis Emmanuel. And Isla Fisher. And, uh, and Steve Coogan. I think there's going to be a Q&A afterwards, so there's not much point saying much about film beforehand. But what I would just like to say briefly is, is that uh, Cameron pointed out that there's quite a lot of absurd things uh, in, in the film. Uh, but but uh, and the film is a fiction. The Steve's character, Sir Richard McCree, is a fictional character. But uh, the starting point was uh, was a, a, a real person who uh, is a famous fashion retail uh, tycoon in Britain. And no matter how absurd things are in the film, in the real world they're even more absurd and more extreme. Thank you.
so I wanted to start by asking, this film, one of the things that really struck us is incredible about it is it mixes so many of your different kind of cinematic modes. Um, a lot of the comedy plays like some of the trip films, but it, it, it deals with the heavy themes of some of the more, you know, um, politically savvy work that you've made. And I was wondering why you chose to mix those things together now in this film. Um, the, the starting point was really, uh, uh, I was talking to a journalist about something else completely, and he told me a few stories about his connections, uh, the experiences he had with a guy called Philip Green. And uh, he, Philip Green owns Top Man and various other brands in Britain, and had just been before the select committee. And he told me, uh, you know, he's a very larger than life character, the stories I was told were quite funny, and it seemed like maybe a, the career of someone like that, you know, so, so, so Richard McCready obviously is fictional, but the career of someone like that, spanning the last 40 years could be, you know, would be an interesting way of looking at what's, what's happened in the last 40 years and the massive growth of, of inequality in the last 40 years, but be able to do it in a kind of way that would be funny. Yeah. And I was wondering, because that comedy plays so rich and off the cuff, for all three of you, was, was, it, was there a lot of improvisation? Was it kind of free in that way? Because it is, it is tightly scripted in terms of scenes, but um, so much of it feels so naturalistic. Yeah, I feel like we all, whoa, sorry. Just my beard. Um, I feel like we all had the opportunity to improvise, um, but it is just, uh, yeah, and obviously for me, the opportunity to improvise is someone like Steve Coogan, who I've always been a monster fan of. Not now that I know him, obviously. Uh, but prior you to meeting him... You couldn't wait, could you? Just so you had to get it in. <laughs> um, yeah, there, there's, there's, there's certainly a, bit of, uh, a little bit of improvisation, but it was fairly, it was fairly scripted. I mean, only little, de little bits uh, of... Uh, Improvisation, but mainly it was a, it was a fully fledged uh, script. Oh yeah, it was a very very moving script. I mean, I cried when I read the script for the first time. Did you? Yeah, because you were going to be in it. It was oh. grieving. Uh, um, yeah, uh, it's fun. Yes, it's, it, uh, it's a strange uh, 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 working. I mean, I've done eight films with Michael, and um, it, it's. Uh, you, there's never kind of a, I mean, from my point of view, when I, I'm just sort of do what I'm told and say what I'm supposed to say. And uh, but it, it uh, but tonally, I, I like the fact that uh, his films are uh, they're sometimes funny and they're sometimes um, tra tragic and sometimes they're just uh, provocative and thought provoking and uh, uh, and, and that, that's that's what I like about the film. Really, I think is is the ability to um, to sort of well, I mean, the, the main thing about the film, I think, it, I, I, I'm really happy about, it, is that it, it's uh, it's thought provoking, but it, yeah. it's not done in a, in a kind of a sanctimonious way. It's quite entertaining, but it's then it's the human cost of fast fashion, which is something we all, as particularly women, we we want to look nice and feel good, but it's just how can we do that ethically? We don't need a ninth pair of shoe at the cost of you know someone getting paid that wage. I'm going to open it up to the audience. Is it? I got a clap. Does anybody have any questions? Back there. So the question was, given given that cost of fast fashion, what were your recommendations for? I don't, I, I can I just say, I don't, want to I don't think that we have any recommendations. I think that if, the, if something good comes out of the film, it should be that where the, the many other issues, important uh, cultural issues like gender identity and race and, uh, and, and, uh, and, and all the things that we're, we're talking about now, the one uh, topic that isn't being spoken about is the huge disparity between the, the rich and the poor and uh, the cost of, uh, uh, and, and that kind of e exploitation that, that goes on that isn't spoken about. So really, I think, all we're saying with the film is that it, it ought to be spoken about. We're not saying... Yeah, we're, we're not attacking saying, the consumer. We're attacking the system. Yeah, and, and really, uh, uh, it's one of those things that isn't, isn't spoken about. Other things are being spoken about now, other difficult topics, but this is something that is, sort of, I think, is the elephant in the room, which is just poverty. And, uh, and, and all we're doing is shining a light on it and saying, let's make this part of this, the, the sort of, the, the, the discussions, the conversation. Um, but, but we're not being. But we're, we're not sort of saying here's the, here's. The, it would be a fool's errand to say this is what we literally should be done about it. Right here. Uh, 
So the question was, is some of that footage actually real? Was it pulled? Was it found footage? Or, or is it staged in those factories? Um, uh, so the, the, the main factories in the film, the main factories in Sri Lanka are real factories. Yeah? So, and, so the, and the women working in those factories are obviously the real women working in the factories. The, the way they go, where uh, uh, Nick, the biographer, go, is taken back to see the living, the living kind of where they live, that's the real place, and they are real workers that, that work in the factories making clothes for all the famous brand, international brands. So, and, and those are the real wages you get. The one, the one staged one was the one where the fire takes place. You know? Uh, that, that where she's supposed to have got, lost her job in the, in the sort of internationally recognised factories, and, the, and gets a job in a kind of cheaper, worse uh, sweatshop. So that was staged. But all the rest of the are real, are the real workers, the real, real factories, and, and you know the wages to get. That's you know what, what is quite shocking is you know that the owner of H and M is worth 22 billion dollars, but the workers who make his clothes, which make his money, get paid about five or six dollars a day. And, and, and that is true across all brands. It's not like in the individual brand, every single brand is the same. So you have these extremely rich, incredibly rich billionaires. The owner of Zara is worth about 60 billion, but the women who make his clothes get paid four or five dollars a day to make the clothes. And, and that is, uh, that's what the idea of the film was to try and show that. So yeah, I should say as well, the refugees are of course real refugees as well. But, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, uh, so they are they were uh, they are Syrian refugees. They uh, are in Greece at the moment. Karim, as it says, arrived uh, on the date he arrived, and he is still in Greece. As uh, one one family that uh, are in the film and are now in Germany, but most of them are still in Greece. Right here. So, so the question was, how did the ethical message of the film affect the production of the film in terms of the costuming, et cetera? I think the costume department did try and make sure everything was as ethically sourced as possible. But that, that is one of the problems, to go back to uh, an early question, that you know, it's very, very hard if you buy clothes to know what conditions they're being made in, what the ways are being paid. You know, you should, I think you know, when you walk into a shop, whether it's Topshop or H&M or, or whatever shop, you, know, you, you see images of glamorous models, you see famous people endorsing brands, you know, it's... Uh, but, but what you don't know, what you don't see the pictures of, the women who made the clothes and how much they get paid, and it's very, very hard to know just because you're paying, buying a more expensive item of clothing or whatever, it doesn't mean to say you're necessarily giving a, a better wage to the workers. I saw, I don't know if it's true, not, I saw figures which said that if you doubled the wages of, of these workers, so if you doubled their wages, it would make the difference of a few cents on the price of a shirt or, or a dress. You know? So you could easily double their wages without really having any impact on the, on the, consu on the consumer end. But it's very, very hard to know. So the most ethical thing, obviously, is to use second-hand clothes and so on, uh, yeah, but, but it's very hard it, you know, in, in the real world to, to know what you're supposed to do. I, I'd like to add to that is that the discussion, for example, that we have about uh, environmental concerns, that we, we all have this open discussion now about how, how we behave environmentally in terms of recycling and all, all the rest of it. That, that conversation has been going for some time now, but the, this, uh, uh, but the conversation about, about this, this kind of exploitation and also the, 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 the fact that... Uh, that we, we have this industry that encourages this disposability of wanting to have not wear last season's clothes and, and, and have, have this new demand every, every, every season. That, that discussion, the environmental impacts of that, um, is something that, that's not been discussed. And what happens is, because of the vested interests of these people, is they, they distract you from having that conversation by having lots of celebrities you know, and these big parties and have lots of uh, 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 shiny distractions so that we don't have that discussion. They don't want us to talk about it because it's awkward. Down here. Were you able to improve the wages of the factory workers through the production of the film and all? No, I mean, so the filming essentially was documentary filming in Sri Lanka. So, so you know, the, you know, it's a, uh, so, so no. So the, the, obviously the idea of the film is to try and draw attention to those issues. We, obviously one film can't solve those issues. I'm just making sure we, if there's any in the balcony here. So the, the question was, how did you prepare for the role and is there a specific person you're emulating or maybe people or, you know? Yeah, Philip Green. Yeah. <laughs> um, I mean, it's, it's not, I don't look like Philip Green. I wasn't prepared to put on that much weight. Um, or, or 
and we didn't have that much money for that that, that much prosthetic makeup. So, uh, um, it, so it, it's it's. But there are it, lots of but, Philip Green. But it's. I mean, yes. It, but the thing is, the character of him. The, the thing about Philip Green, in some ways, you could say, is that. Uh, that, that his overt um, nature is more honest than the more clandestine uh, people who do exactly the same thing as him. He's just sort of sticks his head above the parapet. In fact, makes the point that um, that he's not the only culpable person. Um, but uh, it's sort of. I mean, he's a larger than life character. So, so we based a lot of it on him. We wanted to make the character entertaining and and and, uh, and he is he is whatever you think about it, a charismatic figure. So it's quite quite a good person to base it on. Um, and uh, but but my look was based on, uh, you know, actually someone called Richard Caring who has super super white teeth. You can Google him. Um, <laughs> and uh, and uh, so yeah, so the teeth are based on Richard Caring, but the rest of him is based on Philip Green. That's fair. We have time for one more. I'm going to go here. The question was, did, did kind of the anger towards the people that are abused making the clothes, did it give you a force to the character while you're playing? Well, well, I, I, well I, think, I, think it's, I think it's dangerous to, to, start, uh, to, to, be, to, to judge your character because if you start making an outside judgment like, I want to play a horrible person, I think you're, it, it, you end up coming a cropper. You have to, he, he, you, know, uh, you have to believe that the character, which is partly based on Philip Green and lots of other people, but but really it, it's sort of like you, you, you know, he has to believe in in what he's doing, you know, uh, and believe in himself. So you you, you can't. You, you, so the answer is no. I, I, although I personally am, am uh, you know, have sort of moral and ethical uh, problems with with that that. Part of that, that 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 sort of behaviour. Um, I didn't do that when I was playing him. No, I had to believe in myself and, and believe that it was was right. You should, it's dangerous to judge your character. Um, I'm afraid we're going to have to hand over the theatre, but I want to thank all three of you for coming and sharing the film. Thank and you. Thank you.